It is said that you must never let a good crisis go to waste. And winners do just that. They take a crisis, they embrace its uncertainties, and they come out victorious every single time. They come out stronger and they come out on top. Hello everyone, I'm Mansi Agarwal and you're watching If I Had Not Failed on News24, coming to you straight from Hotel Yakinyati. My guest today is a lady who is working passionately towards taking a homegrown Nepali brand to the world. Her efforts have definitely made a mark internationally and have also given youngsters and young entrepreneurs a sense of faith. She is the marketing and branding director of Gold Star Shoes. She is a passionate learner and a keen businesswoman. She is none other than the fabulous Mrs. Vidushi Rana. Namaste. Thank you so much for being here. It means a lot to me that you decided to come and to share your stories with us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mansi. It's an honor and you're very kind. Thank you. I'm so glad this is happening. And today with you, I'm going to start with the first question mm -hmm. that I ask just about everybody. What do you consider your greatest failure and why? Okay, to start with Mansi, at this age, I'm in my mid-40s. And of course, today I look at life differently, completely uh, different than how I, I used to look at it before. So when you talk about failure, um, you, you know, uh, I want to start with this, uh, this phrase in my life, you know, something that uh, I live by, something, is my, something that is my uh, philosophy. Uh, this quote from Gita, which says that whatever happens in life happens for a reason, and that reason is always good. Of course, I didn't believe in that before, but now I do. Uh, now when I look back at my life and the failures that I had, today I'm a better person because of those failures. But when you talk about talking about failures, um, I have to go really back uh, in my school days. Um, when I was a student, a young girl, you know, in school, um, in, a, in a boarding school, uh, it was a convent, and um, I, was, I was not a good student. I was not good in studies. I was very hardworking though, very diligent. Still, I could not get the marks that, uh, you know, I should have. Probably because I was not good at rote learning at all. And those days it was all about rote learning and I couldn't, um, you know, um, I couldn't rote learn multiplications, uh, Sanskrit verses or history, uh, num you know, dates and stuff like that. And, uh, and I used to just, just scrape through, you know, just pass. And when I was in class seven, um, I failed. I failed in maths. And because I failed in maths, the, uh, the principal of the school called my dad and mom and said that maybe it's better for her to repeat the class because anyway, she's the youngest in the class and uh, she's not being able to cope up, you know, with all the hard work. So maybe it's the best thing to, to just repeat the class. And when I heard that, Mansi, it was traumatizing because it was not like I was goofing around or playing around. I used to work hard, but still, the, still I was not good enough. And that was my biggest failure. And even today when I think about it, I feel that, I feel really bad for my 12-year-old, you know, 12-year-old uh, me or 13-year-old me. I was just getting into my teenage years, my hormones were working up and then, uh, you know, and then suddenly here I had to repeat a class. And that was very, very shameful. That was very embarrassing for me. Um, my mom didn't talk to me for days. And, um, you know, I really, really, really felt bad. I used to look at myself in the mirror and then I used to see a reflection of, the, of this girl. Um, you know, I felt that I was too short. I, I felt that my hair was too frizzy. My eyebrows were too bushy. And I felt, oh my God, I'm so ugly and I failed everyone. Physically, I'm not good looking. Um, you know, mentally, I'm not in a good space. And there's no point living. It and was you actually, at the age of 13, had these thoughts? Yes, at the age of 13, I felt that there is no point living because I failed my parents. I've made my mom so unhappy, you know. So that was my greatest failure. And it was only my dad who, you, who was my soulist then. He used to come and tell me that it's okay, you know. It's okay to repeat a class because anyway, you were too young for that class. You know, you should be around girls who are your age. And it's okay. And um, of course, those two months that I was home for winter holiday, that was the worst phase of my life, even now, when I think about it. But uh, what changed is, I didn't, uh, of course, think about it then, but now when I look back and reflect, I feel that that was the best thing that happened to me. Because when I went to this other class with girls my age, you know, um, 
I was accepted wholeheartedly. I had friends, suddenly. I didn't have friends when I was in that bigger class, you know. Those girls were really mean to me. But here, there were girls who were like welcoming. And today, my best friends are girls from that class. And I started doing well. Um, not exceptionally well, of course, but I was above average. I was doing well. Uh, then I went on to do well in school. I went on to take science later in high school. And it all worked out for me. But those two months, that particular year was the worst failure of my life, I consider. This is crazy because when I look at you today, I see this confident woman, this absolutely beautiful, conventionally beautiful woman as well. And for a young girl of 13 to actually feel that she wasn't beautiful, mm -hmm. there's a certain kind of society that's putting this pressure on us. Mm -hmm. What do you think about it now? Do you think that the pressure at that point, uh, did this expectation to be a certain kind of beautiful? Mm -hmm also bog you down along with the academic failure? Did that add a lot to it? See, Mansi, when I think about it, back in those days, it was the academic failure was considered as the biggest failure because uh, those days parents were not mindful to things like, okay, my child has a um, problem or maybe uh, he or she is facing um, problems like um, you know, mental disorders or like, you know, uh, there's so many things that you go through, I mean, with the children these days, but back in those days, either you were good in studies or you were bad in studies, mm -hmm. you know, and that was such a pressure, and especially I grew up with my cousins who were all my age, and they were all very good in studies, you know, they all went to these really good schools later, and then you were all very good. I was surrounded by, by that kind of um, cousins, and th there were always uh, comparisons happen, comparing and then, you know, it was always like, okay, your, how much percentage did your daughter get or how much percentage did your son get and mine got this much and the parents would actually call and talk about it. Today, I have a daughter and if I ask her, like, like I made that same mistake when she was growing up, when she was really young, I, you know, not just out of habit maybe, I talked to this other friend of mine and I said, oh, my daughter did really well. And then my girl who was like three years old or four years old, she was really upset with me. She said, you are not supposed to discuss what I, what I do or what I don't do with your friends. And that's the time I felt that, oh my God, I've grown up seeing that all my life and that's not how it should be. And even like you said about beauty, about height or about anything, there's so much comparison and comparing and so many um, you know, judgment happening all the time you know, in our society. And we've all been a victim of it while growing up. So, um, it's amazing to hear this from one of the people that I consider to be most beautiful. Oh it's amazing to hear it from somebody uh -huh. who everyone today would perceive as extremely beautiful, which also sensitizes me to the fact that everyone really does go through it. When we talk about it, if you could go through it and if you could go through these unfair expectations that media or that other people are putting on you, of course everyone else would and it just sort of sensitizes me to that. Now tell me one thing, as a young kid you failed 12 or 13 years, went through a bad patch, not speaking to your mom, couldn't have been easy. What did this failure teach you? Okay, today when I look at it, I, I feel that it taught me a lot of things, you know. Today for me, failure is just a stepping stone to success. Because if you don't fail, I mean I've failed innumerable times, not once, not twice, so many times. But today it doesn't bother me the way it used to bother me before. Because today I know that when you fail, you're just going towards your, I mean, of course, when you fail, Mansi, you have to know that you have to get up and walk again. You cannot just lie there and, you know, sit on the floor and say that, okay, I failed and just cry over. You cannot do that. You have to stand up. You have to move. You have to go forward. Uh, that's what has taught, uh, that failure taught me. That, uh, that failure also, um, you know, taught me that life is not always easy, you know. Mm -hmm. Life is tough. Life is not easy for anybody. You might just look at me or somebody might look at you and think that, think that you know, life came easy to us. It did not. And it's not going to be easy even tomorrow. It's going to be difficult. But it's just the way you're going to handle it, the way you're going to move forward you know, with conviction that tomorrow is going to be a better day and tomorrow might not be a better day again. But you have to keep trying. I think that's the whole, I mean, at this age, that's what I've learned in life. Wow, that's amazing. And also, I understand that people, when they see you, they see the privilege. Mm -hmm. But sometimes we don't see what comes behind that mm -hmm. and all the things that you had to go through. Mm -hmm. How did that failure impact the way you think today as an entrepreneur and as a parent, both? 
so just before coming to that, I just uh, thought of this other failure that I feel that I failed my parents was, you know, when I was, I got married when I was 18 at a very, very young age. And um, I was uh, in school, like I had just passed out from high, from high school and uh, I had done science. My dad wanted me to go and uh, go to medical school. He wanted me to become a dentist and I got good marks and uh, you know it was all set but then I was also hopelessly in love with this uh, this guy and I wanted to get married to him and again back in those days Mansi maybe for you it sounds foreign but back in those days it was like okay so if you if your daughter is seen around dating with somebody else then you know best thing is for them to get married because what if you know if they don't, don't get married then who will marry your daughter you know stuff like that and then I got married and uh, and then of course when I got married because I was in love but after let's see six months seven months when I was uh, married in this really conservative house and as I told you I was always in a convent or in always in a boarding school and suddenly I was in this conservative house where I had to be clad in a cotton sari and those were the days I used to feel that I failed miserably I failed my dad uh, I've disappointed him, I've disappointed my mom, and uh, all my friends were uh, going to medical schools, uh, they were going to engineering schools, and these three cousins of mine, you know, th the ones I talked about, they went to Harvard, Yale, and Columbia. Mm -hmm. And here I was clad in a cotton sari, and that's again another moment where I felt that I failed, and I used to look at the mirror, and I used to cry again. I was like, oh my God, my life is finished. But then, that was the time when I took all kind of classes, whether it was computer classes or mm -hmm. uh, typing classes, and then I enrolled myself for um, graduate, I mean, undergrad program, you know, things like that. But I knew that it was not enough. I knew that I had to do something better to make my parents proud of me. And that's the thought that, and even today, whenever, like you talked about business, like I fail every day, you know, I mean, every day I make up, uh, I, I make a chart and then I'm like, okay, let's do this, let's do this, let's do this, whatever. And then we all work towards it, me and my team. And then it doesn't work out the way I, I would have wanted it. So then we'll have to try again and try again. But at the end, it all works out. Maybe not the way I wanted it to, mm -hmm. but the way that it's better for me or for the company. And um, I believe that uh, the universe always has a plan for you. It always does things that will work out for you at the end. So you are glad you did not become a dentist. Oh my God, I'm so glad. I would have <laughs> been a miserable dentist because I would have never known what to do. I would have been miserable in medical school. If I had gone to UK or US to study like my cousins, maybe I would not have met this most wonderful man in my life who I call my husband now. And at the end, it all worked out. See, that's what I mean. So you're glad. Oh, I'm very glad. I'm very happy at the place I am right now, the space that I am. And uh, I think this is what matters. And today my parents, I'm sure they are proud of me. And well, I, I didn't make them proud when I was 13, but they're happy with the way I'm li living my life right now. And that really makes, a div I mean, that makes me happy. Great, that's, that's wonderful to hear because I also understand this feeling of trying to overcompensate. Mm -hmm. You know, you could not go into medical school at that point, which you wanted to, mm -hmm. but then you try to overcompensate mm -hmm. typing, you know, this, that, just trying to learn everything to sort of make up for that, to make yourself feel better about your situation. Mm -hmm. That sense of overcompensation, do you feel you still have it? Do you feel you still carry that? Because very often, and I speak for myself as I say this, I wanted to do a bit more with my life. I wanted to study a lot more. I was aiming for a PhD. I could not. I was married off too early. And exactly the same story, okay. really. We're on the same tangent in a lot of ways. Uh -huh. And I try to overcompensate. And this habit of overcompensation still runs within me. And very often I try to do just a bit extra because I'm trying to make up for something that I regret having lost. Do you feel that yes, as well? Yes, all the time, all the time. I feel like I have to do so much more because I started late in life. So I feel like I have to reach there faster, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Yeah. So there's always the 20s. Like, I think I just missed yeah. out in my 20s. Yes. So in your 30s, or I'm in my 30s, 30s is like trying to run. And it's a race against time to sort of catch up with whatever you wanted to do. And yeah. that's, that's, that's nice to hear that even other people are going through this because... Yes, but uh, now that I'm in my mid-40s, you're still in your, in your mid-30s, I assume. So um, for you, maybe that's true. But for me now, I know that it's okay to just sit back and relax and smell that coffee. It's fine. You know, so the forties have right. sort of yes. given you that sort of space yeah, and to I'm do that. Yeah, in few in another four four years, I'm going to be fifty, and then now it's just a number, you know. Yeah. So I guess life teaches you that. I think maturity will come with age, and you learn to 
that it's okay I and mean, you've achieved a lot right. and that should just give you the happiness and the satisfaction how important is satisfaction um Mansi, it's very important to be happy now whether it's because you're satisfied or because you've achieved something or you know i think at the end of the day you need to be happy and that's what covid has taught me i mean these past two years with you know today i do a lot of introspection and retrospection and i sit down i meditate a lot like every day i do my meditation and breathing i never used to do that before covid but now i do that every day and it's given me that sense of you know i it brings you uh, i mean the i think the most important thing at the end of the day is to be happy whether it's for me whether it's for my husband my children my staff everybody because if you're not happy at the end of the day it doesn't matter i might achieve so much tomorrow i might become a billionaire but what if i'm not happy inside you know what if i'm not healthy inside it does, i mean all those things won't matter so at the end of the day i think it's about being healthy it's about being happy and it's about the people you love that's the core thing that uh, should be important to you and this wisdom comes with maturity of and all those failures yeah, and yeah, struggles yeah, and whatever yes, else yes absolutely tell me about work again you're in a male dominated kind of a sector uh, of course you're an empowered woman mm -hmm. come with education you've come with a lot of knowledge into this you worked in a bank before so you've come with a lot of knowledge how do you feel people around you perceive you as a boss is it a lady boss or a boss or a leader what do you consider yourself to be? Mansi, so I get asked this question a lot, of course, because of a uh, patriarchal society. I mean, women are always, they feel that they've been um, overshadowed by men. But luckily for me, uh, I think that um, it's not the same case with me. Because even while I was growing up, uh, I have a brother. We grew up together, but my dad and my mom and my grandmother, I think they used to pamper me a lot more than my brother. So I was always the center of attention and I got married in, in this house where my husband treated me like one and even at work today and even when I was working in the bank I know my colleagues used to feel that mm -hmm. but maybe I was I was um, blind maybe I didn't see that coming but I don't think that I was ever uh, you know dominated just because I was a woman of course being a woman of course being like be because I went there as a boss and not as an employee in my company right now, of course, people think that it came easy, f easy to me, but it did not. You know, people think that everything, oh, everything was laid down in a silver platter for you, so it was easy for you. But that's not the case because when you go there as a as a leader, you have to prove yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, and then you know that you're being judged all the time. Uh, pe there are people who want you to fail. Maybe your family members, maybe your partners, maybe you know. They're just waiting for you to fail, not because I'm a woman, but because I come from that background or because I come from the owner's uh, owner side. You know, they might feel that okay, maybe she's not good enough. What is she trying to do here? What is she trying to prove? So you always have uh, people judging you all the time, and it's so much more difficult. So it's on the contrary, it's uh, contrary. You know, it's not easy at all. You just have to work so much harder to prove yourself and to gain that respect uh, as a leader. I don't want to be a lady boss there. I don't want to be a boss. I don't want to be a leader too. I just want to be a part of their, uh, part of all of them, you know, so that together we can work at because for the same mission and vision that the company has. So the speculation you're saying is higher because of where you come from and because people think you just didn't have to climb the ladder. You yes. got it easy, served uh -huh. on a platter. Yeah. And that speculation is pressure? Huge pressure. Is it? It is. Do you face it? Do you have to hear it? Directly, I, indirectly? I had to. Um, so it's been around six years that I've uh, been working in my own company at Gold Star Shoes. And uh, now it's better. Now I can feel that people have respect for me, not because of who I am, but because of the work that I've done. Uh, there are people who actually call me and ask me for advice. And I know that that is genuine. Um, so it did take time, of course. Uh, first day when I went to work and especially in my factory there are like 3,000 workers all back then all male you know I mean all men and suddenly there's a woman there and then of course they'll look at you even like at the bank like I don't know whether you would call it um, being dominated but you know I used to go to the bank wearing skirts and um, jackets and because I wanted to have that feel you know to do go to a corporate uh, world but then I suddenly I realized that that's not how you should dress up in Nepal because I mean maybe now you can but not 20 years back you know and then I started wearing salwar kameez and going to work and then I felt so much safer so those things of course did happen and I don't know if it's changed a lot now but um, I hope it it has and I hope it keeps changing
Of course, yeah. we're going to evolve yeah. and we have, I'm guessing, yeah. quite a bit. So tell me one thing. Today, when you see yourself as a part of this team, what do you think is your biggest contribution? Is it your ideas or is it the fact that you can sort of see a bigger picture that sometimes people miss? Because we'll come to leadership next and that's why I want to know this. What is your contribution as this leader in the team? So, um, so this company uh, is a family-run business and my father-in-law passed away six years back, just going to the history of it. And uh, so my husband being the only son, he was running the whole show. And uh, I did uh, my bachelor's, uh, my undergrad in uh, marketing and branding. And I felt that Gold Star was not doing any, any of those, you know. And uh, I've said this many a times and I used to ask my husband as to why aren't you doing branding? Why aren't you, you know, promoting your brand? And then he always said, it's a brand that everybody knows. It's a 40-year-old company. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows the brand. And who's going to spend that kind of a money on a brand? So, um, you know, after my father-in-law passed away, uh, I wanted to do something on my own. I wanted to start my own business. But then that's the time I realized that my husband was really alone and he was struggling the battle, uh, you know, um, and running a big industry. So I asked him if I could join him and then maybe look after a certain uh, sector, you know, and maybe start branding for the company. And then he was convinced and he gave me a certain amount and said, OK, well, I'll give you a year. Let's see if you can do well, well and good. If not, then, you know, you can start something on your own. And that's when I went to uh, went to the company and started uh, branding the shoes. And then, of course, there were a lot of problems that I faced then. I had to do a lot of research in the market. And then uh, and then I felt that I could do justice, you know, to the brand. And we did a lot of branding. We did a lot of campaigns. And then I felt that there were a lot of young people who were not wearing the shoes. Only a certain type of people were wearing the shoes. Only the people who knew about the shoes. The youngsters were not wearing the shoes. So then, you know, I took the initiation to uh, work for better, uh, more stylish designs for the youth. And we came up with a different series called the G10 series. Now the youth love our shoes. Um, then there were other things like, you know, uh, I was like, we make such good shoes. Why don't we export it, you know? And then uh, again, in the company, they were all like, maybe we're not good enough or maybe the quality is not good enough. But I said, why not? We, we make shoes with Italian uh, machines. Um, our shoes are really world class. And just doing a little bit of tweaks and uh, you know stuff like that, we could. And then now, today, we've been exporting to a lot of places. We export to the US, uh, to Japan, to Bahrain, to Australia, to Malaysia. So uh, we've, uh, you know, even our international wing and uh, that and I think a lot of things have uh, we've made a lot of changes then the other thing is like uh, you know uh, people knew about gold star shoes but they didn't know where to buy it so uh, they would be like where do we go buy it and uh, we don't want to go to Asana Indra Chok to buy it so then I came up with the idea of opening franchise stores again my uh, the people in the board were skeptical they were like I don't think anybody would want to open a franchise store for uh, shoes you know maybe we should open it on our own I said no I mean we, we as a company we cannot spend that uh, much of money let's just try franchise model let's see if people want to open uh, franchise stores for our shoes and today uh, we have 90 franchise stores ar uh, across the country so you know things like that and um, I'm very happy and I'm proud of the things that uh, I've done or made a difference. Of course, it's not me doing it. It's the team, it's the effort. But I think uh, just together we've made a difference in the company. Um, you know, I mean, it's now just run by my husband and me. It's a couple running a show. Uh, so he has his own things that he looks after and I look after something completely different. We never bring back home, uh, work home and things like that. We have certain rules and regulations, but um, it's completely different what he looks after and what I look after. And now it's I'm independent, you know, I don't have to ask money from him. So the, so the annual budget is over. Yeah, now. the annual budget, I decide and I say, okay, no, whatever he gives me, I'm like, no, I need some more, you know, I need to do this. And then he, and he can't <laughs> even say anything. Of course, because yeah. clearly, clearly it's working because you managed to export, you managed to create a brand for the younger generation and you managed to do this. Mm -hmm. So, of course, the franchise model and everything else has been working in your favor right. because I've been hearing a lot of wonderful things about the brand myself as an outsider. Mm -hmm. Tell me one thing now, you've done all these wonderful things. Do you think leadership is something that you learnt the hard way or do you think it came naturally to you? Because this is something I personally right now mm -hmm. have very conflicting opinions on. Mm -hmm. And I want to engage in this dialogue more than anything else to learn because there are certain aspects of leadership that I'm trying to demystify for myself. Mm -hmm. So did it come easy to you? Because you're somebody 
who was maybe handed a few things easily, yet who had to grow into that role. Mm -hmm. And how do you grow into something that's maybe too big a platform for you sometimes? Mm -hmm. So how did you do that? Did it come easy or did you really have to learn, struggle, fail, learn again? Both actually. Uh, because I had, not that I had to learn, but I learned because uh, I was married in this business family. I've been married for 25 years now. So dinner conversations always used to be about business, you know, with my father-in-law around and my husband. And so we did, like, I did not come from a business background. So for us, dinner tables and conversations used to be about different things, about board games. But when I got married, it was all about business, you know, about the new machines, about the new business, about the new ideas. So I think those 25 years, of my marriage taught me you know how to become a leader because obviously i would learn so much from my husband uh, husband my father-in-law who was a chairman at the bank and then um, i learned a lot from them and um, some things do come naturally to you because whether you're handling your house with your five staffs or whether you're handling your two children or whether you're ha handling a big industry with three thousand people i mean the principle is the same right I mean, your leadership quality is the same. Your, how you become, how you make everybody work uh, for the benefit of that company or that house is the same. Um, I think you have to take the ownership. Whether I'm talking to my staff, like when I, whenever I get a new staff in the house, I tell him that now this is your house. Don't mm -hmm. think like you're working for somebody else. This is your house. So if you see a chocolate wrap out there, you have to pick it up. And when I see it, I pick it up too, so that he'll learn from me. And it's the same thing. I mean, it's a very small thing. I mean, a very small example, but that's the same thing in the factory too. When we have meetings, we make everybody feel comfortable and tell them that we are all a part of Gold Star family. Don't feel that you're a, you're an employee and I'm a leader or you know I'm the owner. So I think it's very important for everybody to, for you to, as a leader, I think it's very important for you to make everybody feel that they are a part of that um, that game. And you should like really feel it from your heart too, not not just say it, but you know, for us, our um, our staffs are our family. That's that's wonderful to hear that. And also, I'm thinking that fine, you didn't make it to dentist school, but at least you were at the dinner table at the right time, You're right, with the right it people, was, having was, the right conversations. Uh -huh. And this is wonderful because you talk about inclusivity a lot. Uh -huh. I realize you talk a lot about being accepted, mm -hmm. accepting other people into your family, mm -hmm. into your home, into your business. And you talk about making people feel included. Mm -hmm. Do you think this comes more naturally to you being a woman? Because you also spoke about handling, when I talk about leadership with entrepreneurs generally, they will tell me about numbers, about the vision. Mm -hmm. You spoke about other people. Mm -hmm. Do you think this comes more naturally being a woman? Because you also spoke about handling your children, mm -hmm. handling the the helpers in your house, handling the way your home runs, and then sort of taking that and superimposing it into your business. Do you think it's naturally easier for yes, you? Yes, I think so. You being a woman, me being a woman, we are naturally, we are nurturers, and then we know how to do it. I mean, it comes naturally to us, right? Absolutely. Because like, like when you were asking me this question, I was just thinking of the many calls that I make every day to the staffs now because they are they you know they they have COVID oh. and then I'm just asking them every few days as to how they're feeling or I'm sending them a message saying that are you okay uh, you know do you want help or whatever and I know my husband would never do that or a male maybe maybe he would not be able to understand it the way I do because I'm a woman so you're right they need I mean they need I mean it there has to be a woman on the top I think. I love company. that. I love that you think there has to be a woman on top because yeah. of the sense of empathy, uh, empathy and everybody yeah. to feel like the ownership right. of the company, as right. you said. So tell me one thing. How, how good do you think the combination of your husband and you working together on the same brand yet separately? Mm -hmm. How good is this combination? And I'm not talking because you're married, mm -hmm. but how good is a combination of two people working on the same thing in completely different roles? How easy, difficult is it? So uh, I feel that uh, family members should not work together in the same, in the, I mean, do the same thing. Mm -hmm. Then there will be a conflict. So in my company, my husband looks after sales and uh, about business and machines and, you know, uh, labors and uh, stuff like that. While I look after marketing and branding and um, export and things like that. And we work completely different. Uh, I don't want him to tell me all the time what I should do or what I should not do. And I know it's likewise for him. But, uh, but I feel that you, like, even tomorrow, if both my children want to work, come back and work in the company, I know that they have to be kept separate. 
Mm-hmm. Otherwise, there would be a conflict. There would be. Yeah. As a parent, uh, what kind of expectations do you have from your children? Because now we've come to this part right. where you we started with you being a child. Mm-hmm. your mother having expectations of you you somehow not being able to meet up mm-hmm. to those expectations mm-hmm. and today you're a parent of two young children mm-hmm. who will one day come back and who will possibly want to join the business mm-hmm. as a parent how important do you think it is to have expectations of your children mansi i would have i would like to answer saying that you know i i don't have expectations from my children but that's not true i'm a parent i'm a mother and i do have lot of expectations from my children but I try very hard not to impose that on them. Mm-hmm. Uh, my daughter is in New York. Uh, she's just finished her undergrad, and uh, my husband is always telling her that you should come back. You should come up, come back, look after business. But I keep telling him that it's okay. Let her be there. Let her be able to spread her wings. Let her be able to f- find her own footing. Maybe that's not what she wants to do. That's okay. I say it in front of her, but of course inside I was I will be like, oh, I wish she would come back, right? and my son is in london he is in school right now and then uh, every time my husband talks to him about you know you have to come back you have to look after business and then i feel the same way but when i talk to him i tell him baba it's okay you know whatever you want to do it's fine but you should know that you have parents who are going to back you up no matter what you want to do if you want to become an artist if you want to become a um you know uh, you want to do philanthropy you want to be a pilot anything you want to do it's fine we're going to uh, be there for you but of course inside my heart is screaming saying please come back please say that you want to come back and i my children tell me that we are confused because papa and mamu are always telling us two different things papa is always saying that you should come back look after business that's you know we've created this for you and mamu is always like no 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 we just go spread your wings so what are we supposed to do and so now as a mother i'm thinking okay am i confusing my children too much maybe you can have them watch this interview so that they know exactly <laughs> how you feel inside yeah. cuz so being a parent is difficult mansi i mean parenting is another very it's a difficult uh, thing i mean tell me about it i'm <laughs> raising a 7 and a half year old it's not the easiest it's not easy any lessons from leadership any lessons from being a parent that you take into the corporate world i think a lot of things i mean of, of course we talked about nurture being a nurturer being um Uh, showing empathy to your staffs but also listening to them mm-hmm. uh, also being there for them also um you know asking them for their viewpoints because we were not when we were children we were never asked whether you are happy or not but i do that with my children all the time because these days it's different you know these these kids are different mm-hmm. they're more exposed to their world travel they are so much so much smarter and uh, back back then we used to get so many scoldings and beatings from parents and teachers i don't think uh, kids these days i mean they can't even think <laughs> of anybody slapping them i mean that would horrify them so you are messing with my mental I health know. i yes. will do this i've heard that yeah. i've heard a kid saying that to their mother you messed with my mental health don't I tell know. me about these things i know and kids these days are so smart and aware good. And i mean of course they're aware of a lot of yeah. things and it's it's yeah. amazing like i talked about how i used to look at my at the mirror and hate myself now uh, this body shaming is such a big thing you cannot talk about that with anybody you know you cannot even, for my son i like i can't even look at people when we're walking if i look at somebody it'll be like mom you're not you're not supposed to look at that person and i'm like why but i'm just looking at her or him and like, no, no no you're not supposed to look at him mm-hmm. so kids these days are very very different and they're aware and i just love how they're sensitive very i think sensitive. they're also more sensitive to other people these yeah, days i yeah. see a lot more empathy yeah, in, yeah. in the kids around you're right they're very nice they're very kind to others they know um and then they treat everybody equally and that's really beautiful to see so on a parting note i've come mm-hmm. to my final question okay on a parting note i want to ask you if there's one thing just one thing that you want to tell young entrepreneurs young people who are entering the business field who are probably struggling right now if there's one thing that you can tell them that has changed you due to the first failure that you had what would it be or what did you learn from that first failure that people can apply in their lives today just one thing okay again another verse from gita it says that samay se pehle aur bhagya se adhik kuch nahi milta right so that means that before time and uh, more than your fate you're not going to get anything and i truly believe in that um so what i would like to tell the young entrepreneurs uh, is first of all dream dream big 
and w you know work towards your dream you are going to get there you're going to stumble and fail and but be miserable and you're going to cry but ju you just have to get up and go towards that goal because one day it's going to be there maybe not the way you expected it to be but you're going to get there if you have that conviction and um, also um, young girls or boys today are so much more ahead of where we way we started right they're so much well exposed and they've had better education uh, they're but much more exposure so I think it's just easier for them mm -hmm. than it was for us but uh, I think just um, just not be scared of failures mm -hmm. at all because your show is all about being and you know about I mean it's such a beautiful uh, theme and uh, it makes you reflect because when you asked me this question I was like okay can I talk about this in on a national television and uh, you know about my failures and today at this age I don't mind talking about it because if it can make a difference to any even one individual's life I mean it's a good uh, it's a good show Absolutely. so it's okay to fail that's all I want to tell people it's okay to fail and in fact failure makes you more humble mm -hmm. uh, failure makes you more grounded uh, and uh, because if there was no failure, then imagine what kind of people we would have. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. If you sailed all through school and college, mm. you would have been a different my person, God, perhaps, yeah, right? Completely different. I'd be such an egoistic, <laughs> uh, full of so myself. Absolutely. And I love that you spoke about how important it is. Mm -hmm. The reason I, I actually came up with this concept for this show was mm -hmm. because we need to normalize conversations around failure. Mm -hmm. Each one of us likes to talk about all the things we right. do well and that's fabulous. Right. But we also fail, each one of us. Mm -hmm. And I wanted youngsters to learn from stories such as yours. People who they look up to mm -hmm. and people whose lives from the outside on social media, in the media look picture perfect. Mm -hmm. If you too have gone through things, that gives somebody else hope. And really this show, might sound like it's about failure and it is truly about hope and that's what I want to thank you for. I want to thank you for sharing your words, for telling us it's okay to fail and for showing us that you could fail at 13 but be absolutely awesome at 45. Thank you thank so much. You. Thank you so much Mansi, it's a pleasure. Thank you. Today's conversation with Vidushi Diju just gave me an insight into her life. It was very refreshing to hear how she has actually managed to work her way through the one failure that she had as a child. It was wonderful to hear that today she's extremely happy with all that she's achieved in life in spite of the fact that she didn't always get what she wanted. It was also enlightening to hear her thoughts about privilege, her struggles and how sometimes empathy was the one gift that she brought to the world. Thank you so much Vidushi Didju for being somebody that we look up to, for being somebody that we always can learn from and for so honestly sharing all that you did with the world. Thank you.